So right now, the Perth Wildcats are in sporting crisis. They know it, and we know it. But here's the thing. Despite all the finals appearances and all the trophies, the Wildcats have been in crisis before, and they've won championships in the same years where they have been in crisis, which means the question now is, how do clubs get out of crisis? So it's time to find out. Yes, Trevor Gleeson, welcome back to the Dribble Podcast. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Coaching isn't easy, is it? You've been through it in the past where it's been a bit, been a bit of crisis and they're, they're in a bit of crisis now. How, how do you handle crisis management? Yeah, well, that's that's a part about leadership as well. And it's funny, I just finished up a talk a couple of weeks ago with West Track executives and talking about this exact matter. And it's, you've got to plan for it. It's going to happen at some stage. It could be an injury. It could be... Uh, you know, Matty Knight getting concussed in the grand final. What do you do? You know, I think you, we used to have a term that we had war games. So we would practice situations that would happen. And so if it did happen, we'd be ready to go. So part of that leadership is how you deal with it, but you can also preparate yourself for it. So when you get into these scenarios, you talk about war games and being being ready for it. How do you get ready for it? Like, because these guys wouldn't have experienced this as a team before, and John certainly wouldn't have experienced it as a coach before. So, how do you get everyone ready to not panic when the big moment arrives? Well, that's where leadership. You got to be leaders coming forward and take responsibility and saying, "This is the vision that we want, and this is what we're trying to get to." You know, we we had uh, a number of times that you know I think we'll talk about a little bit that we were last on the ladder at Christmas. And the pressure was building up because we made the playoffs 31 years in a row, you know. So how are we going to get to the, the playoffs, number one? And then how are you going to win a championship? And it starts off, you know, what you're going to live with and what you're going to die with. And that's where you've got to come up with the plan and be in front and do your job. The leaders have to lead. When crisis hit, leaders have to lead. Some politicians go on holidays. Other people stand up and say, OK, I'll take responsibility. This is what we've got to do and move forward. So you mentioned being on the bottom of the table at Christmas. This is what you had to say after you got out of that situation. We weren't playing a good brand and we had to look for a new import and make a hard decision. So there, uh, yeah, there would have been open and honest conversations. The change, it was uh, just focus on what we can do. I think all of us at that stage put our hand up and we were worried about the referees or worried about other stuff. We've got to control what we can control and that's playing hard, playing together and playing the right brand of basketball and that's what we've been doing the last month. Sounds very similar to what you just said then. So it's a simple philosophy, but you've got to make sure that everyone does it correctly. So that's 16-17. You're on the bottom of the ladder at Christmas. You win the championship. How did you do it? Yeah, well, we had a lot of problems with the imports. We had um, Johnson that we released, and then he stayed here to stay in shape and waiting for the next opportunity. And then our next import came in, Ingram, lasted two games and got homesick, wanted to go again. So we were always looking at what... Jalen wasn't a great fit for us and then we just kept on looking and I remember still Christmas Day I'm making phone calls to agents trying to find out who's available and going through a number and then Bryce's name came across the list and I remember I seen Bryce at a summer league and I said this is the guy this is the guy we got to get so it was that piece that we really needed to complement what we already had um, and you know he rocked up, rocked into Sydney and dropped 27, I think, first game. And, you know, we had to, I think we had to win the last four or five, four games out of five to even make the playoffs. But it was always that vision that, hey, guys, we make the playoffs, we're going to win a championship. We make the playoffs. That was our first goal, to make the playoffs, to get back into contention. And then as soon as we made the playoffs, we had to play Melbourne United in Melbourne on the road last game of the season. If we lost that, we wouldn't, not made the finals. But I think we won by one or two points at the end. But everyone thought in that room, we're going to win a championship because that's that's the vision and that's what we talked about. We're going to make the playoffs. We're going to win a championship. So we heard the audio of you there and talking about being honest with each other. You had a big honesty session midway through that year and you didn't see automatic results, but they came a couple of weeks later. So when you sit everyone down and say, let's, let's talk, how important is it for everyone to actually say what they're thinking and not hold back so that you can get it all out on the table. Yeah, and, and we did that a couple of times throughout my course. And it's having that open and honest conversation to saying this is where we're at, this is where we need to get to, can you help us get there? And I think we got, went through with stop doing some, we said stop, start and keep nearly every player. And it was like keep being encouraging. I remember Greg High standing up and said, Trev, stop getting on the referees. Start coaching us. Keep being positive for what you're doing. 
Um, and I thought, okay, my focus wasn't right, so the team's focus probably not right. So that's when I tried to pair back and just focus on what we can do in those situations. It's hard mentally for players. Well, that stop-start keep thing is a, a really big part of sport. Learning, uh, leading teams has done that a few times with, with a, a lot of teams. But the ability to keep everyone focused and doing what you say that you want them to do wouldn't be easy, I wouldn't have thought, after, even after you step out of that meeting. Well, that's where you've got to hold people accountable. You know, you can't go out in the meet and say one thing and do the totally opposite. So, hey, listen, we had this open conversation. This is what we agreed to. These valuables, sorry, values and principles and behaviours that we agreed to, now you're not keeping your end of the bargain. So now we've got a problem. So you either can fix it and do it or I have to replace you. I'm going to give you a chance to do it because I believe in you and I trust you and I want you there. But if you can't physically do these things that you agreed to, I'm going to have to make a move. So then you, you win the championship that year. And then a couple of years later, you go to Utah in a preseason with a totally new team. You lose by 58 points. And it's fair to say that wasn't a great way to start the season. But then you, you start the actual season 10-1 before things go in a different direction that way. So you've had the low, you've had a massive high, and then something goes wrong midway through the year. How did you get them out of that situation? Because you won the championship that year as well. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure because um, we only went with two imports. And that year, I think it was the first year the NBL went to three imports. And we were really comfortable with our player personnel. And to start the season 10-1, and I remember flying back from Utah and Denver. We got beaten by eight points, I think, by Denver a couple of nights later. Damo played that game. We didn't play the, the first one against Utah. We flew straight to Adelaide. They lost all our luggage on the way over there. We had to... We had to um, you know, practice in boxer shorts and some Qantas uh, pyjamas. That's all we had. We had nothing. But we won the game, you know. And I so say, this team's got some resolve around there. So we we went 10-1. and one, And then we had some injuries throughout the season. I think Damo got injured. I'm pretty sure Matty um, might have got injured with that. Or, uh, sorry, Angus got injured. Um, so it was a rough patch that we were going through. We weren't all fit and healthy. And... Everyone was crying out, well, why don't they sack somebody and bring the third import in? You know, we talked about it internally, how we're going to do it, but it was a belief system in the team that we can do this moving forward with the same squad. And that's what we did. We just need to get healthy and get back on the court and play in a good round of basketball. So I don't think it was a coincidence at that time. We talked about how we had the honesty meeting at 16, 17, and a couple of weeks later it turned. A couple of weeks later after you said, no, this is our squad, we're not changing anything, that was when it turned as well. So do you think that the, the best way forward is always to have the, the big conversation of we, we're backing you and then eventually the, the players have realised, well, we are what they want and we are sticking together and we are going to do this as a group? Yeah, and that's that's... You're going to get judged on your actions. There's no use saying it in the meeting if you don't follow through with it, you know, and that's where we've got a good opportunity to put in place what we said. And you've got to follow through, win or lose. It's the way we play the game. We all t- talked about if we play the right way, we have a shot to win any game. It doesn't matter whether it's in Perth, in the States, in New Zealand, anywhere. And it's getting to play at that level, you know, the intensity, you're playing unselfish, you're playing team basketball um, and you're putting your defensive end, you know, you're showing some pride on the defensive end. And that's, if we do that, we're going to go close to winning games. It was getting back to that level. And then once we did that, we started to get that synergy in the group again. And then no team could come close to us. It's not easy being coach for Wildcats, is it? There's pressure from left, right and centre when you're, in, when you're involved there. Like, what's the intensity like? Yeah, it's... you got to... We, we talked about putting the shield on you know and the the red army is a great fan base absolutely brilliant fan base and they'll get behind you 100 percent. but it's also your family your friends your co-workers everyone else has an opinion oh you should be playing more minutes oh they should be playing because they're passionate about it and that's okay but it's also putting the shield on it and listening to what's in the room you know that closed circuit of having your teammates and talking, this is what we want to do. I'm going to hold you accountable. Can you do it? Um, you know, and somebody else saying, hey, listen, you've been skipping out on recovery. You're skipping out five minutes. Is that important for you? Is that the, Are you committed here all the way? And that's team honesty in that group. So, and that stays inside. That stays inside the team because it's where the trust is built. 
And in a pressure situation, that's where the trust comes out. And you'll get to a tight finish of the game. If the team crumbles, you can usually say, well, there's some issues there going on because it comes to the surface all the time in a pressure situation. We were lucky to have some great personnel in there, not only brought in, held everybody accountable, and we had that culture that the next generation had to follow that line. So this team needs to... Put a shield on it effectively. Stick together, put a shield on it and ignore the outside noise. Yeah, but they've got to do actions. That's yep. action. Talk is cheap. You gotta you gotta do it with actions. And it's not only, you know, just uh, it's playing team ball, having your teammates back, you know, regardless of what's going on in the outside world. It's the inner sanctum that's important at this stage. So you mentioned talking about the fact that close games decide things. Well, close games decided things in the NVL on the weekend. There were three games decided by three points or less, and that's very rare. It's only five times it's happened in the past three years. Three mm. games decided by three points or less and in the same weekend. Your record in those sorts of games is really impressive. 34-26 across your career in games decided by three points or less, which is very, very good. Well, well, let's go to the Tyler Harvey situation on the weekend where he hits the match winner and then there's 0.3 of a second left on the clock. We've, we, we, I, I, you've mentioned in the past to me that you had a 0.4 of a second or 0.5 of a second play. That's how detailed you got preparing for games. Take us into that scenario where you'd be trying to win the game. Yeah, well, that was that was a great shot by Harvey. You want to try and get the ball out of his hands at half court, you know, and make someone else beat you. It's, um, but you would, we had a play for eight years we never got to use in the game. It was 0.4 of a second to go, just in case. And it was not only that, it was for Damian Martin. So when Bryce is getting double teamed, they're taking the ball out of his hands. What's, so using Bryce as a decoy and using Damo... And it was on the left side of the floor. So not all NBL benches are the same side. Some venues you change over and you have to advance the ball opposite you because of FIBA rules. And sometimes it works on the left side, sometimes it works on the right side. So we had a play for Damo that all the players knew. I didn't have to have a timeout. We just called the play. And um, unfortunately, if Damo tells me he's going to make it every single time, we never got to play it in a game. But we, you have that in your in your playbook as a coach. You have a three-point on baseline. You have a three-point side out of bounds. You have a full court pass. And, you know, we have a three-second one. Then we had a Hail Mary. Just in case you need it out there. And all the players should have gone through it and know their roles of that position. So how often do you, do you practice each of those plays then? Because it's a lot of information for players to be able to remember when the heat is genuinely on and when, it, and when the crowd's going nuts. Like, how many times would you go through that in a season or in a week even to make sure that everyone knows each scenario? So, did the last second plays, we would do that every shoot-around. And it's, it's quick at the end because they all know it, but you build that up. Um, you know, we would have a practice, just a full practice of two hours of work in late-game situations. Like, two minutes to go, you're a point up. Five minutes to go, you know, you're seven down. 14 seconds left, you're on the foul line and you're three points down, you only got two foul shots, what are you going to do? So we work on our trapping, where we want to go. So you would play those scenarios out at practice and you would have a few pet plays that you wouldn't call during a regular season. I remember Damo called a play, we had it on baseline and I went mad at him. They said, what the hell are you calling that play for? So oh, I just thought we'd get two. No, that's an end of season. That's the end of game play. That's for four seconds left. If the shot clock four seconds, that's the play we're doing. I said, oh, okay, all right, no worries. But that's, you want to be detailed, you know, because the games are going to get close. So if the players don't know what they're doing on the floor, you, you're praying. You've got you to be organised and got to be detailed at that. So can you go back to them more than once? I look at the, there's a famous one of Bryce Cotton, winning the match over here against the Brisbane Bullets where Mitch Norton inbounded it. Then I did the same thing against the Brisbane Bullets up there, but he inbounded it. And then you look at the one where Jesse Wagstaff famously missed the easy layup and it was a decoy to John Mooney, to Wagstaff, and, and Bryce gets out of the way. Like Three match-winning plays, one which didn't work, but you, you didn't go the same way ever. You went with a different style. Like, Is it important to have so many options that no one knows where you're going? Yeah, well, you don't tell the players all that information. That's the coaches to do resource. But it's who you're coaching against if they're switching defences. So let, let's use Bryce's example. Nine times out of ten, he's going to get trapped. All right. So if he inbounds the ball, they haven't got a chance to trap him. And he came back and got a handoff there. It was kind of um, a brush play. Then they were going to switch. I knew that they were a switching defense. So we put a slow defender or a bad defender coming up, setting the screen. 
And then Bryce had the ball and he elevated up and, and made the shot through there. Um, so it's different coaches that, that you know you're coming up against that they like to do certain ta- tactics. You've got to have ready to go. And ultimately, that's what decides whether you're top, second, third, fourth, miss the finals altogether, isn't it? Those, those games are the ones that decide your season. I remember when I first started coaching in America in the CBA, I lost about the first six games all like on the buzzer beat. It was 0-6. I said, like, what the... So I rang up a mentor of mine and, and I was just depressed. I was down and I was saying, I can't run a play. It's, and he said, Trev, stop. He said, your job is not to make the shot. He said, your job is to get the player open. And after that, I said, well, you're right. So it kind of took the pressure off me. He said, my job is to get the ball to Bryce, Bryce Cotton Right here, right now. Now it's up to Bryce to make the shot. If he makes it, we're all good. And, you know, he has a high strike rate of making that. That's the same thing. Your job as a coach is to make sure you get the ball inbounded. I thought Brisbane got really lucky with that pass that went to half court and almost got stolen and they had a three at the buzzer to tie it up. So we would have a situation. We don't want to throw the ball near the half court line. We had a situation and everybody knew it. We're going to throw the ball in the dead corner. If the referee's counting four, almost going to blow the whistles for five seconds, we're throwing in that corner, and we want that toughest player down there. We used to do it all the time with Roselle Ellis. I said, we're just throwing the ball to Roselle Ellis late in the game because he's going to get the ball. Wasn't a great foul shooter, but he was going to get the ball and it wasn't a turnover. It's amazing how detailed you have to be to be elite in sport. Well, thanks for coming in. It's good, always good to talk. Fascinating about how you finish games. Fascinating how you um, handle crisis management. And if you do want to have Trevor Gleeson talking to you about crisis management or anything else as a five-time NBL ch- winning championship winning coach, you can go to trevorgleeson.com, can't you, Trevor? Certainly can. Thanks, Craig. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Cheers.